Good day, everybody, uh, whether you're in South America, in Europe, uh, in Africa, in China, Asia somewhere, or whether you are here today in the present or you're in the future. If you are in the future, 30, 40, 50 years from now, you may ask, well, how come people in the beginning of the 21st century, they were so smart, they could explore the universe, they could, uh, you know, transform their environment, the natural, interfering with the natural systems to create welfare. They could overcome space and time to communicate. And yet they were so laxly using geological capital to harness energy. They were actually undermining the very basis of our survival, the survival of human race. Well, let me put that a little bit in perspective. We did have some success in the past, in the past century doing, you know, working on an energy and development agenda where we developed many technologies, where we created welfare, where we provided modern energy to a very large number of people at low prices, low market prices, not low cost. Well, yes, we did make some things wrong. We have some failures. There is a cost to pay. There is a liability. We have to address that now. We have an uneven distribution of the welfare, and we have uh, actually managed our resources mm, in not so good way. So we need to deal with that now. And of course, climate change is, in a nutshell, the expression of the impacts of energy systems that we have been building to actually support all the, the other systems we are creating in our society. And they have been giving us some good rents, but also now there are other rents to be paid. So we have to find a new narrative for development. How would that be? Well, it has to be a detachment of development from resource depletion. It has to be an agenda with uh, improved equality. It has to rethink the industrial and economic logic that we have created, and that is actually leading the development of different systems that we are creating and transforming. From our side, we also need to explore the new planning processes, because the process, the institutional arrangements and the policies that we have, they have been created actually according to that industrial and economic logic of the past. And I propose that we capitalize on linkages and synergies of different sectors that will work beyond the energy sector, not with the energy, with the energy sector on its own. The sustainable development agenda that we have now, that we're working on in the present, it sets a number of goals. And these goals are, for the first time, goals that are in, embody a vision for humanity as a whole. The, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, this is a social contract for humanity. So it's the first time, it's an agenda we are, which embodies the understanding that we cannot do fantastically here if somebody else is paying the bill somewhere. In, in, in the same planet, yeah? And it's actually the first time that energy is spelled out as a goal because we understand that energy is a major enabler. Without energy, we cannot even start addressing, for example, the first of these goals, which is poverty alleviation, to eradicate poverty on Earth. Without, we know that in the first, age, in the first steps of development, energy plays a major role, a major role in improving the Human Development Index. And, of course, the, the climate agenda is so closely linked because most of the impacts we have on the environment uh, and most of the emissions actually can be traced back to the energy systems that we have in place. So there are many other linkages here, but I wanted to highlight particularly this, this fact of having worked with energy so long to see that energy now at least now it is part of a very, very clear agenda for development. And maybe, maybe, we have had a convention since 1992 for climate change, uh, uh, for addressing climate change. And maybe for the first time, we are seeing signs that perhaps 
we are reaching a peak demand that also implies a peak uh, um, emissions. But it's not time to commemorate yet. Now, what am I proposing? I'm proposing that we think that th these energy systems that are going to be sustainable, robust, and, and efficient, they, you know, they have to be different from this linear approach that we have had where we say, okay, we need energy, so we take primary resources, we process them, and then eventually they will come uh, either as electricity, as fuels in our ta the ca tanks of our cars, or something like that. But this is the open logic that has created resource depletion, waste emissions, and climate change. So we need to move towards a solar economy. But the solar economy is not only about technology. It's not only about uh, going from non-renewables to renewables. We will have to address other things in society and other systems so that we, can, we actually manage to deal with this introduction of the solar economy. And we need to improve the circularity. We stop with the linear approach and go with the circularity. So how far are we from the circular economy when you look at these pictures? Yeah, We are very, very far. And this is the reality of, of really many, many places. This is the reality of many places. This is, you know, in Bali, a tourist paradise. Yeah, So there is still a lot of work to do. In Sweden... Uh, look at this. We, we can address this in different ways. One way is that we say, okay, we have all these impacts or these, you know, open uh, pits that we, we have created with the with consumption site we have built. So we, uh, we start recycling uh, the things, that, uh, the, the waste. And that's, that's a very nice start. In, in Sweden, for example, when it comes to household, we have come to almost uh, zero. And landfilling, let's, let's face it, landfilling is a system failure. Landfilling is not a solution for waste management. This is a system failure, and it has to be dealt with. So here we have seen a transformation towards uh, material recovery, uh, biological recovery, energy recovery, and so are we getting there? Well, we have started because actually a lot of this energy recovery perhaps could be material recovery. Yeah, a lot is being incinerated. So there is still work to be done. Also in Sweden. Uh, so another way of, of looking at it is to, to look at, okay, where, how is the inputs, the material inputs in, in, our, in our economy? Uh, this is uh, important material input, which is steel and uh, uh, iron and steel. So the iron and steel industry produces materials that are very central to many things, for infrastructure, uh, building, for many products that we have in our, uh, in our homes, in our society, everywhere. Yeah? So with this model that was developed in my research group, the, the scrap model, we looked at, well, could we live only on scrap without actually getting new, new inputs in, in the system? Well, we calculated that. We looked at saturation you know, per capita, looking at the, 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 the population. We said, yes, not in, nine, in 2050, not, but in 2100, it's actually possible. It's possible. Uh, and, uh, well, but it's not going to happen on its own, uh, by itself. We have to orchestrate that. So we can start looking. We, this is a project we did together with the Swedish industry and uh, look at the different types of alternatives. We have to put in place the infrastructure that we will actually use the scrap, but we need to make sure that the scrap is available. So where is the scrap available? So this is a kind of a supply uh, approach at the, this. But I'm exploring also the interfaces. I want us to explore the interfaces when we try to transform energy systems. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we talk about agriculture, then we have this the debate on, oh, if we, have land, if we use the land to produce biofuels, then uh, uh, feedstocks for biofuels, then we will not have land enough for food. When it actually, it's not one or the other, it's both. Yeah, whatever you, you as we upgrade uh, agriculture in, in, uh, in Africa, which has, where not much has happened in, in many decades, uh, actually food prices also were, were lower in the late 90s, many food commodities were uh, lower pr 
priced in, in the late 90s than in the late 30s. Uh, the reason why maybe there was no big incentive for developing this agriculture. So we will develop agriculture. Why, why, why don't we think the development of agriculture also with a strategy to provide energy access in rural areas of Africa? Because rural areas have proven to be some of the places where it's most difficult to come with the energy access. No energy access, modern energy access, no digitalization. Only 15% of the people in developing countries are digitalized. And this can actually imply that we, are, we will open the gap. We've been closing the gap, as I started, but we may be opening the gap again if we do not address these issues. But bioenergy is many different things. We need to couple uh, uh, bioenergy. Uh, to produce bioenergy, we need to couple energy production with agriculture or with forestry or with waste management. In Sweden, we have a very good marriage between uh, the forestry industry and the bioenergy utilization. And although bioenergy utilization has increased constantly, we have more standing forests now than we had 10 years ago. Yeah? So it is possible to manage the resources so that you get most uh, efficiency of the material utilization that you have. Another end to work on this interface is on the policy side. This is a project we have on, with Indonesia. And in this study, we looked at the, the, the coherence between the policies that are designed for agriculture, for biofuels, for climate, and for forestry. And here you can also say, well, well, if we use the land for agriculture, we cannot use it for palm oil, and we cannot use it for climate mitigation, and we cannot use it for forestry. Well, maybe if we actually addressed some of the issues the, 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 uh, together, we would not have to uh, end in this situation with, where we don't have a full compatibility with what is being proposed, uh, not least because we don't have a very clear uh, definition of what is actually covering each part of the land, uh, of the country in terms of, of the land coverage. This is a, a third example uh, on this interface. This is in, in Bangladesh, where we look at the use of cattle dung for biogas. Well, so far, no, no, no news. Okay, we can use cattle dung for biogas production. This is being used very much in, in both rural and urban areas in, in many places in Asia. Uh, and increasingly, we're using biogas also uh, in other parts of the world. This is very important because you can have, of course, a cleaner fuel coming to the kitchen, which has a very important positive impact on, on health for particular women and children. But if you are actually paying attention, if you're not trying to solve this as only an energy problem, you could actually add something here. You could use the low heat of this process and clean the water. And we know that in Bangladesh, we have serious problems of arsenic in the water everywhere in the country. And, we've, and cleaning, clean water is really a scarce commodity. And it costs a lot of money. But by adding this, uh, this service, we have the same amount of resources. We can produce more. We actually solve problems related to energy and related to water. So we need to work towards a sustainable energy system, as we always say. But that for that, we need a transformational agenda. And in that transformational agenda, perhaps the city is a very, very good place also to, to start. Because in planning, I'm, I come from, energy, from, from urban and, and regional planning. And the tradition in urban planning is not to include energy. It's much more about land use, mobility, functionalities in the, in the urban environment. But energy is being very much taken as for granted, as a given input. Yeah? Of course, this is changing, but long from everywhere, I can tell you. So there is still a lot of work to do. But in the cities, we have the generation of most uh, of the wealth. We have also most of the emissions, most of the energy use. We have the scales. We have the smart people. And uh, we, this is uh, the closeness can also mean that we can work these interfaces in a much more intensive way. One example uh, of how we can actually start thinking the, the, the transformation of the systems we have in the city is this uh, uh, project we have with Stockholm about upscaling electric buses 
in the city. We have many demonstration projects, but the upscaling puts completely different challenges. And we could see that uh, actually once the system is in place or a partial electrification of the bus system, we will actually mean that the price difference for running this system and the, a, a traditional biodiesel-based system will not be very different. So this is actually quite good news because then we see, okay, but we still have the threshold of providing the, the infrastructure and we are working on it. We have another project where we're looking, okay, what are the other benefits of electrification that could perhaps be captured and quantified and, uh, you know, put together, we need to put together uh, other stakeholders here to actually finance this, this transformation. If you want to be part of this transformation, the energy transformation, you may come from any kind of, of, of uh, area. Maybe you come from the building industry, you come from, from the waste management uh, sector, or you come from the transformation industry, the manufacturing industry. You can still work out the interface. Come talk to us. Let's talk about the interface, how you can be part of the transformational agenda in the energy sector. And... Uh, to achieve that, we cannot stay working in a single discipline. We cannot stay uh, in only interdisciplinary either. We have to invite for transdisciplinarity. And that means we will co-create with multiple stakeholders. Yeah, it's not anymore about the academy uh, dividing, uh, um, devising the technologies that will provide the solutions. Well, that's part of the problem, yes. And that's part of what we do in KTH. But we also address the interface to make the transformational agenda a reality. A reality that will include, of course, a circular logic. It will include multiple actors in the transformation. It will mobilize society and different stakeholders. And certainly, we require that we to be orchestrated. So I'm inviting you to participate in the transformational agenda of the energy sector and to build a future with sustainable energy systems because that's the only future that we can have. Thank you.